No, th no, thank you very much. Uh, uh, when I was coming here, I was given a speech. And uh, it begins by greeting in my home language. Um, I speak Venda. So when I was looking at the spelling, the spelling is quite uh, wrong. <laughs> so, so when uh, Livete was introducing me as a chemical engineer, I was wondering whether I should even read the speech. You know? <laughs> uh, I, am, I, I did my undergraduate in mechanical engineering. So, um, Dumelan. San Juanan. Etisen. Karibu. Kedu. Murao. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Apa kaba. I thought maybe uh, when we do these greetings, there will be somebody in the audience who know what I'm talking about. But good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2019 THE Universities Forum in partnership with the largest university in Johannesburg. And, and before I actually uh, 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 finish my speech, I would like to acknowledge the presence of all the vice chancellors. We have the vice chancellor of the great university of, of Pretoria. Uh, of, uh, I think let's give him a round of applause. Uh, the vice chancellor of uh, uh, at the University of Ibadan. Uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of uh, Rwanda. Uh, and, and the Vice Chancellor, I, I cannot see the Vice Chancellor of the Professional University in, uh, oh, <laughs> in Ghana. And we have a provost from the University of, of, of Ghana, of Accra, uh, and, and other dignitaries that I have not mentioned. So we are the largest university in Johannesburg, and one of the largest universities in South, Afri in, in South Africa. Uh, we have 52,000 students. When I took this job last year, I can assure you my, my hair was completely black. <laughs> and my deputy vice chancellor can testify to that. Of course, uh, South African university system faces quite a number of challenges. But when you are the vice chancellor of one of them, one of the things that you are worried about is uh, students' demonstration. So every time I hear people singing, <laughs> I rush to the window to figure out whether <laughs> they are not singing all the way to my office, you know. Um, but you know, uh, the University of Johannesburg is really special in many fronts. Firstly, it bears the name Johannesburg. And Johannesburg is a, quite a strange name because nobody seems to know what it actually means. Uh, some people say that uh, when the name emerged, they were ma we, we do know that it is from the name Johannes, which basically means John in Dutch. But uh, there is speculation because uh, Johannes is such a, it's not a last name, it's, it's a name in South Africa. It's such a common name that when the name emerged, Nobody can be able to point out how it actually originated. And this city was founded on gold. There's, there has been almost like, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, uh, an outstanding uh, uh, 
statistics, 30% of all the gold that has ever been mined was mined uh, in Johannesburg. And because of that, we cannot build any building that is uh, uh, taller than 60 floors. Because we're actually sitting uh, on top of tunnels of all the mining that happened over the last uh, uh, 100 years and more. So this is a multicultural city that uh, is the financial capital of actually the African continent. You have more f finance in Johannesburg than Lagos, Professor, and than any other city in, in, in the continent of Africa. The largest concentration of wealth. Of course, things have been changing uh, because um, the mining industry is a sunset industry in South Africa. We are really, uh, feel, we are really thrilled to be partner with the Times Higher Education. When I was uh, a PhD student at Cambridge, uh, I used to read the Times Higher Education Supplement. It used to come by post. I know young people who are in the room don't know what a post is. <laughs> um, it's not quite exactly like WhatsApp. I miss Mloyo. So, it is exciting that we have managed to bring all these diverse leaders and thinkers across teaching, research, and business, and policy uh, making in order to share expertise and best uh, practices. I'm reminded of an expression that uh, knowledge not shared is no knowledge at all. And people have been quite generous in sharing their knowledge. I participated in the I participated in the presidential roundtable. Unfortunately, the table was not quite round. It was actually a, a perimeter, isn't it? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the discussions were very, very round. And what we were talking about was how do we enhance the concept of a university? Because many people actually believe that the concept of a university is not going to survive because of online learning, because of the advent of, uh, of, 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 of other forms, platforms for, for teaching and learning that have emerged over the last years as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. I still believe that a university, despite all its weaknesses, we know some of its weaknesses, it has not completely shaken off its vestiges of the Catholic tradition. We still go to graduations looking like uh, uh, Catholic monks. And by the way, uh, 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 monks were the teachers for many, many years. Uh, at Cambridge University, the teachers were the, the dons, and the dons were actually monks. And the founders of institutions such as Oxford, Paris, and, and, and Cambridge were actually monks. But there are many things that we have moved on. The concept of, of thinking freely, which was not always acceptable. We know what happened to Galileo uh, when he, he came up with ideas that were not in line with uh, the thinking of the day, the theological thinking of the day. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that universities are sacred. And uh, it will be sad if uh, in their current form they disappear altogether. And I don't think that is going to happen. So the Times Higher Education is one of the organizations that we as university vice chancellors and principal 
actually get worried about at certain times of the year. I feel when rankings are about to come, uh, Professor Sorab will be walking up and down the corridor like a madman. <laughs> you know, whether it is THE, whether it is QS, whether it is uh, Shanghai, the, you know, uh, the reaction is the same. And uh, uh, when it does happen and uh, the rankings does emerge, then you will find all sorts of, uh, you know, of uh, media releases. And, and many of them are, I like the concept of positive thinking. And many of them will concentrate on measures where the universities have actually improved. And there are people who were saying that, uh, I was talking to somebody from one of the universities in Johannesburg. I'm not gonna mention the name of that university in Johannesburg, but uh, suffice to say that it is not the University of Johannesburg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so somebody was telling me that, no, 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 we are going to be moving out of rankings. I said, no, 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 please move out of rankings, but we're gonna stay because we believe that Rankings are important to capacitate, to make sure that uh, universities adapt. When we look at rankings and we look at our weaknesses, we improve on those weaknesses so that we will perform better. So it's an excellent mechanism for us to benchmark ourselves with our peers, not only in South Africa, but uh, in the world. So, Rankings, I believe, especially the THE rankings, actually advance the mission of a university. They make us a better university that is ambitious and that is determined to improve itself, whether it is in teaching and learning, whether it is in research, innovation, and commercialization, in order for us to move forward. We were quite excited when uh, we were ranked in the top five, you know, by how much we are transforming society. Because education is really there to transform society. It's there to make sure that we are able to improve our capacity to produce, uh, so that our people can be able to, to enjoy the fruits of of production, whether it is in the industry, whether it is in government services, very, very important. And I think if there is any medication, and in South Africa we call such medications muti. Uh, muti means, uh, you know, uh, it's a traditional uh, thing that you are given so that uh, your shadow can be heavy. If there is anything that uh, uh, you should be given in order to, for your shadow uh, to be heavy is education. Education, there is no magic education, informed population. An informed population is able to make a rational democratic choice. An informed uh, population is able to build uh, capacity to produce. The productive forces are modernized uh, through education. And of course, um, uh, 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 education. And education should not be confused with certifications. Because many of our people want to go and get certificates. And when you go and ask them, you know, can you try to explain to me what uh, um, what is the difference between a transpose and uh, an inverse? And I'm not going to pick on you, Lebo Hang, because I know you are not going to be able to know the difference. In, uh, uh, and they forget and they learn all these concepts. Uh, Einstein actually put it very well that uh, when he said, education is what remains when you have forgotten everything that you have learned. Um, so, 
I cannot emphasize education enough because education is what liberates us from superstition. And superstition is not only uh, something that is uh, geographically uh, constrained. Because many people think superstition, when you think of superstition, we are talking about uh, what happens in our villages. Uh, when I was at Cambridge, uh, there used to be, I used to live next to a, a park, it's called uh, Parker's Peace. And they used to have a bonfire every, every year. And I asked them, so what is this bonfire for? They said, no, 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 no. About 250 years ago, this is where we used to burn our witches. And many of those people who were accused as being witches, they ran away to the Americas. And that superstition followed them. We know what happened in Massachusetts, the burning of witches. So basically, education has to liberate our, us from superstition and replace, it, and replace that with, um, with scientific and evidence-based ways of reaching decisions. Very, very important, especially for our politicians, that you have to use evidence to reach conclusions if conclusions are not reached using evidence, they cannot be rational decisions. We are actually quite excited about uh, what we have been able to achieve over the last few years. When I came to the University of Johannesburg 10 years ago, the university was nowhere to be found. It was not on the ranking labels. The fact that we are, we are in the top five universities in South Africa and we are accelerating to the top university in South Africa is actually to the testament of our determination to change um, the fate of our people. Just on research alone, uh, we just overtook the University of Cape Town. Uh, Professor Tawana Cooper, you know what I'm talking about because you, you uh, reposted that uh, uh, results uh, over and over again. Of course, he reposted it not because we, over, we had overtaken the University of, of Cape Town, but because his university was ranked the, the top university in South Africa, <laughs> according to that matrix. And of course, because of that uh, we obviously, it means that we attract much more than the same money. So it is very important for us that we improve ourselves. I need to end by talking about one of the issues that we addressed. But to a limited extent, we have to take the university system into our communities. We just signed a memorandum of understanding. It was the University of Johannesburg, University of the Witwatersen and UNISA, and the city of Johannesburg. Basically, the universities uh, in the city of Johannesburg. And one of the things that we contribute to as the University of Johannesburg, we expect our students to spend six hours per month in community service. Every month, each one of them must go to the city of Johannesburg and do some form of community service. And the reason for that is because we believe that education must serve society. If it does not serve society, then I don't know what kind of education it is. Very, very important. We should take our university systems into the society. Secondly, we should take our university system into industry. If you go to Anglo-American mines and universities are not represented, then we are not doing what we are supposed to do. If we go to our banking sector, one of the most developed, maybe perhaps the most developed banking sector in the continent, <coughs> and you don't find our universities, then there is something that, uh, uh, that universities are not doing right. 
If you come to our departments and you look at our industrial uh, uh, advisory boards and you don't find sufficient number of people from industry actually advising us on what to do, then there's something that we are not doing right. So all those things are things that we really have to, to battle with. And one thing that we need to do is to take our university into industries and take industries into our universities. The same with our society. We take our university to society, but society must also be in our university. Whether it, is, it expresses itself as research, whether it expresses, whatever, however it expresses itself, it has to be on our campuses. Very, very important. And thirdly, universities should play a pivotal role in shaping the political dimensions of our society. Very, very important. If our politicians, and there was uh, uh, not too long ago uh, in parliament, I saw uh, somebody asking one of our senior politicians, I'm not gonna name who the person is, but the video is public, what is the fourth industrial revolution, sir? And then the explanation was not uh, what the fourth industrial revolution is about. But the thing is, where are universities if our politicians are not able to explain things that are defining our times? Where are our universities? We should not be ashamed of taking our universities to the political class of our society. And the political class must also come to the university to see what is going on. Our School of African Leadership, uh, that is led by Dr. Sidney Mufamadi, actually is training all the parliamentarians in Southern Africa. Not too long ago, uh, I cannot see the, the Vice Chancellor of University of Botswana, I saw him uh, earlier today. I saw the Secretary General of uh, the ruling party in Botswana, uh, actually in, in that classroom. I see parliamentarians there. And the reason for that is because education is not something that you can finish. I think it was uh, Asimov who said that. And most importantly, if you are a public representative, you cannot finish studying. You have to study all the time. You know, in fact, the only time that you stop studying is when you are no longer with us and when you have gone to another uh, world. Very, very important. So we should actually be hegemonic uh, as a university system in influencing our politics, our society, our industries, because we are the source of knowledge. And without knowledge, our society cannot progress. So with those few words, uh, thank you very much for, for coming to Johannesburg. And uh, Phil, there are many other activities that we are going to do together in the future. Kia leboa, bye danki. I remember receiving Times Higher Education in the post. I remember working for Times Higher Education when we used to post it out to PhD students at Cambridge. I've been there for so long, 20 years of my life dedicated to Times Higher Education, but I do, I do love the publication. So actually I want to go back in time, but not quite as far as, as 1996. Back in 2015, when actually Times Higher Education held the first ever THE Africa University Summit here in Johannesburg with our wonderful hosts for this forum, UJ. There were only four universities from the entire continent of Africa 
in the THE World University rankings. We had three from South Africa, one right up north in Morocco. In last year's list, there were almost 50 ranked universities. 19 from Egypt, nine from South Africa, six from Algeria. We had universities from Morocco, Nigeria, Tunisia, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. 10 different African nations represented on the world stage among the world's very best global research universities. And in the 2020 World University Rankings, which I will publish at the World Academic Summit in September this year, I'm delighted to reveal exclusively here tonight in this room that we have received data submissions from 73 African institutions. I can't at this point guarantee they will all make the final ranking, but I can say that this dramatic rise in representation is a great cause for optimism. It's of course a testament to the great progress being made by Africa's universities that so many now stand on the world stage, no more than five years after the inaugural Africa University Summit. This improvement and strengthening of Africa's universities will be vital to ensure the whole continent reaches its full economic and social potential. As Chilidzi has said in the program for this forum, Africa's universities occupy the forefront of the continent's renewal and revitalization, as he articulated so clearly just now upon this stage. African universities must be able to compete on a world stage in the production of new knowledge, the creation of the next generation of leaders, in the driving of technological innovation, in order to avoid brain drain, to ensure they contribute fully to the fourth industrial revolution and drive Africa's renaissance. The world is moving firmly into a new era of innovation. After profound societal change brought about by the steam engine, steel, electrification, petrochemicals, ICT, we are now entering what I believe and quite clearly is going to be the most profoundly unsettling and transformative innovation wave ever, the rise of intelligent technology. And this fourth industrial revolution fueled by machine learning and artificial intelligence not only raises profound questions about what skills and talents human beings will need to survive and thrive, it raises profound questions about what it even is to be human. And I think with evidence emerging of alarming biases and prejudices being built into uh, Western developed, global North developed AI and algorithms, I think Africa must ensure it's at the forefront of this revolution. It's got to help lead this revolution. It can't be led by it. And it certainly can't afford to be left behind. So it's hard to overstate the vital importance of world-class universities in Africa working on profound global challenges, but with Africa's interest at heart, uh, and for the success of Africa's future. And I would say genuinely, and we'll show tomorrow with the data and analysis that we've prepared for this forum, that the signs from the World University rankings are very, very promising indeed. But a massive part of this forum will focus on how African universities can best harness data to meet their individual needs and the wider needs of Africa. I think it will include, and I accept, it will include a challenge to the current rankings, methodologies, and metrics, including Times Higher Education's own rankings, asking if they're providing the right data platform, the right framework, the right benchmark for Africa's universities. When we held the Africa University Summit here in Johannesburg back in 2015, I promised that THE would develop new rankings, new performance metrics that better reflect African policy priorities for Africa's development. And thank you to UJ for pushing this agenda and pushing THE to be more responsive to Africa's needs. While some African universities thrive on the world stage and must compete with the best in America, in Europe, in China, in the traditional world rankings, not all African universities wish to be judged on the world rankings criteria, and nor is it always appropriate. We spoke at the presidential roundtable today about decolonizing rankings. They do have biases that favor Western universities, Northern Global North universities. So I'm really delighted to be standing here tonight and confirm that what I promised many years ago in Johannesburg, hosted by UJ, I'm now returning to say we actually delivered to some extent on that promise. It's taken a huge amount of energy and effort 
but we have delivered something unprecedented in global rankings. We've broken the mold, we've disrupted our own model, and we've pioneered a new way of looking at excellence. We've created the university impact rankings. The inaugural Times Higher Education University Impact Ranking was published back in April as a pilot. These examine a university's social and economic impact based not on traditional measures of prestige or research or wealth, but on the many and multifaceted ways universities contribute to the UN's sustainable development goals. I'm thrilled to say that in the inaugural impact rankings of around 500 universities, 35 were from Africa. Several African universities secured world top 100 positions for their overall impact on society and the economy and the SDGs. Many did even better in rankings for individual SDGs. Let me give a huge congratulations to UJ, actually ranked fifth place in the entire world for its contribution. <laughs> for its contribution to SDG 10, reduced inequalities. These new rankings can get to the heart of the change that universities can make, the difference that universities can make beyond the traditional notions of prestige and the traditional notions of research. So tomorrow we'll explore the data from both the world university rankings and the impact rankings in depth. And of course we can share ideas about the best pathways forward, the best individual pathways for individual universities for their missions and their priorities to ensure that Africa's great universities power this continent's fourth industrial revolution. I'm delighted the University of Johannesburg, after in initiating conversations with THE's first ever Africa Summit some years ago, has had the initiative and the drive and the passion to convene this important follow-up meeting and to bring together such a prestigious group of leading sector thinkers, to work together, to share insights, to share experience from across the continent, to ensure that Africa's institutions can realize their full potential and power Africa's renaissance. Thank you very much.